my topic this morning is the keys of the kingdom and um to be to be very truthful what i'm about to share this morning will kind of feels to me like an unfinished message in other words i'm going to share something where i don't i don't have all the answers but i have enough that i think is worth sharing so i hope that we will be we will still receive a blessing sister sonia i did not stop the recording but i am able to cut it after everything is over so don't worry about it um okay so my title this morning is the keys of the kingdom and i want to start by reading a verse that we we discussed last week sabbath evening in our our prophecy study it's um it's revelation 3 and verse 7 and it's Jesus speaking, and he he says to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true. But the part I want to emphasize is where he says, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Now, when you look at this, passage these words what what do you see emphasized what i see here is that jesus is focusing on authority his authority he says i have the key of david and when you talk about david what you are talking about is the kingdom because god promised that he would give the kingdom to david and to his descendants forever when jesus was when the angel came to announce the birth of jesus he said um he said to Mary, I will give unto him the kingdom of his father, David. He will sit upon the throne of his father, David, forever and ever. So whenever you see the Bible referring to David or to the, uh, uh, or to the keys of David, what it is referring to is whenever it mentions David, it is focusing on the kingdom. So when Jesus says he has a key of David, what he means is that he has the, all the authority of a king in the kingdom. And th this ties in with so much that Jesus says elsewhere, or that the Bible says. For example, in Matthew 28 and verse 18, we are very familiar with this statement that Jesus made. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus has been given all authority, all power. And this is. This is this is true for the entire universe. You see, you see the same thing highlighted in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm sure we are familiar with this passage, but it's this is a passage where it says, um, in verse 27, it talks about what God gave to Jesus, and it says, For he hath put all things under his feet. God put all things under the authority of Jesus. So, so when Jesus says, I have the keys of David, the keys of David are the keys to the kingdom. I, I'm not sure. I, I believe that when it says the keys of David, it refers to the authority in the kingdoms of this world. I don't think the kingdom of David, I could be wrong. But from my understanding, the keys of David, the kingdom of David, does not include the entire universe. It's something that is related to this planet. Because, G because God promised that David would have somebody to sit upon the throne forever. And he was speaking about the kingdom of this world. As a matter of fact, let me show you another verse that kind of supports this. Um, in Revelation chapter 11, look at what it says here. In verse 15, Revelation 11, verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the kingdom is particularly focused on this world. 
when Jesus came and, and he began to preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was referring to the establishing of, of, of God's kingdom on earth. But in a peculiar sense, it refers to the kingdom of David. And the kingdom of David is the kingdom that relates to this planet. So when Jesus says, I have the key of David. And I, I shut and nobody opens and I open and nobody can shut. He is referring to the absolute authority on this planet. Now, in connection with this, I want to read a couple of interesting verses. Let me start, first of all, with Matthew 18, verses 17 to 20. Let me start from verse 16. Jesus is talking about how we should relate to brothers and sisters who have a problem with us. Let me start from verse 15. He says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, take with thee one or two more, that it, in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen, a heathen man and a publican. So Jesus, Jesus shows us a sequence of steps that we should take if we have a problem with somebody. First of all, we go to the person. We can't resolve it. You take a friend or two, you go. You can't resolve it. Then you go before the church. Now, when he says a friend or a person, I assume he means a church brother, a brother in the faith. Then you take two or three believers. Then finally, you go before the entire church. And what Jesus is, Jesus is saying is that the, the church of God on earth is the highest authority. The church is the highest authority God has on the, on the earth, which is interesting. I, I admit that my, my, my favor towards the church and my, my, my willingness to submit to the church is biased because I've been associated with, 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 denom with a denomination that was called the church. And the way this denomination abused its power and authority, I became biased and prejudiced against church. But what I recognize is that the church is a biblical concept and it is something that God loves and it is special to God. It's very special to God. But the problem is, is where we have misunderstood denomination to mean the church. We have confused both things. And I realize that for me and probably for many of us, we need to get rid of that misconception because I have an inherent bias against other people having authority over me. And um, as Christians, we have this individuality in religion. However, what the Bible shows us is that the church, the true church, when the people of God come together, the true church, not the denomination, people who, who have the spirit of God, then this is to carry some authority. Because look at what Jesus says next. Look at the next verse. Verily I say unto you, that is the church. When you go before the church with this matter, I say unto you, whatsoever, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He goes on to, 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 to solidify the point by saying, again, I say unto you that if two of you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I'm going to come back to verse 30. Don't forget it. But I'm going to kind of bypass it a little bit just at this moment. What I want to focus on here is where Jesus says that as far as the church is concerned. Believers gather together, two or three, in his name. This is the church. Where two or three are gathered together in his name. This is the church. And he says of this church, 
Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever decision you take on, on, on earth, heaven will ratify it. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is a, it is a tremendous level of authority. And many times, you know, to be honest, I, if, if, if you are like me, I know you have been tentative about verses like this, wary of verses like this. Because look here, the Pope uses this verse. The Catholic Church uses this verse. The Seventh-day Adventist Church uses this verse. They use these verses to bind you under their authority and, and to make you understand that when you come to understand that there is one God and not a trinity, they say the church has authority of God on earth and you must submit to the church. And you don't, so they disfellowship you. They kick you out. And they use verses like this. And if you're a superficial reader, it seems like they have a case because are they not the church? Is it not the church? And did not Jesus say this about the church? He said it. You can't deny it. It's in the Bible. But I'm going to show you that there is something else to it that sometimes I'm pretty sure most people might overlook. But as we look at this, I, I just want to point out, if you tie this to what we said, we read in Revelation 3, 7. If I just remind you of what Revelation 3, 7 says. It says that Jesus says, I have the keys of David and what I, I shut, nobody can open. And what I open, nobody can shut. Look at this passage we are on right at this moment. And you will see that it is the same kind of, of statement. Jesus says, anything you bind, nobody can loose it. And anything you loose, nobody can bind it. Heaven itself ratifies the decisions that you make. This is the same kind of authority that Jesus is speaking about in Revelation. In Revelation, he says, I have the key. But here he says, I am giving you this authority. And I'm going to show you where he actually uses the word key. Go to, Rebel, uh, go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16 and verse 19. Listen to what Jesus says here. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And this kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of David. It's, a, it's the authority of heaven come down to planet earth. It's the kingdom of heaven set up on earth. The kingdom of heaven is heaven's system of government established on planet earth. It doesn't mean, it does not mean the kingdom that exists in heaven, in heaven or in the universe. It means the, 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 the kingdom that is based on the principles of heaven and the authority of heaven established on earth. This is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And look at what he says. Anything you bind on earth, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's the same exact thing we, he, he says in the two verses we just read. The one in Revelation, Jesus, said, Jesus says, I have the key. In this verse, he's saying, I give you the key. I give you the key of the kingdom of heaven. What he's focusing on is great authority, great authority. Now, what it simply means is that you have the power to operate as though you are the king. If Jesus is the king and he has a key, and he says, I will give the key to you. If you go to a king's palace, if you go to a king's palace and he, he, he says, I'm giving you the keys to my palace or even the key to my kingdom. Look here. You can go if you if you if he has truly given you the key. It means you can go to any door in the palace. You can go to his treasure room. You can go to his dungeon. You can go to any place in the palace and you can open any door and access what exists in that palace. You know, sometimes I'm not sure how this works, but I know that sometimes they will give the keys of the city to a certain person. If they give the keys of the city to Brother George, if he goes to Paris and they give him the keys of the city, I'm not sure exactly what it means, but I know that it means that in Paris, he's going to be a very privileged person. I mean, in, in the world today, it's, it's kind of like just a form a formality, just a, just a token thing to give you the keys of the city. 
but I, I know it has some kind of, of authority behind it. You know, it's like access to the bright spots and the and the the popular places. I'm not sure you'll be able to open the prisons or going to go into the banks or anything, but at the same time it means that you are treated like a special person in that city. But Jesus says, when Jesus says, I give you the keys of the kingdom, he explains what he means and he says, anything that you bind on earth, heaven is going to acknowledge it and stand by it. And anything you loose, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Heaven is going to acknowledge it and the power of heaven will be applied to your, your, your statement. Now, let's go on to the question of what is this key? What is this key? Because that's the most important question, I believe, because it's nice to know we have this authority, but then I would ask the question, why would we say that the, the, the denomination does not have this authority? How can we be certain and how can we establish that Jesus is only speaking to a particular group and how could we claim this kind of authority for ourselves? What makes us the church if we are, as opposed to the, denom the denomination being the church? which they are not, what could we say to support this kind of statement? Well, I'm just going to look at a couple of other places where it mentions something similar. And I want us to look at what is implied here. In Esther 8 and verse 8, it doesn't mention a key, but it suggests something that has the same kind of authority as what Jesus mentioned in Matthew 16. Um, this, is, this is the kingdom of the Persians, but I believe the Bible is hinting at this kind of thing. When it talks about a kingdom, it's talking about the way things operate in a kingdom. And look at what it says in, in, in Esther 8 and verse 8. This is Esther's husband, and she, he says he's responding to Haman who wants to hang, uh, who, who has made a decree that they, um, the Jews should be killed. People should go out and make war against them. But the king says, write you also for the Jews as it liketh you. Write in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse. So that's kind of similar to what Jesus says about the kingdom, isn't it? It says about the key of the kingdom. He says, he opens and nobody can shut. And he shuts and nobody can open. And, and he gives us authority to bind and nobody can loose. And we loose and nobody can bind. This is absolute authority in the kingdom. And it's something like referring to the, 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 the name of the king. It's something that is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring, nobody can reverse it because the king represents absolute authority. So, what exactly is this key? And I'm going to look at um, a couple of other verses. Let me start with John 20, and I'll read verses 22 and 23. Now, this is the verse that ties things together, or it, or it begins to tie things together. Look at what Jesus says in, in, in John 20. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Don't miss the impact of this, brothers and sisters. Did we just read something like this? Let me go back to where we just read something like this. Matthew 16 and verse 19. We just read it. It says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When does this happen? When you are given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven enable you to bind anything on earth or to loose any, anything on earth, and heaven ratifies it. And Jesus, and, and Jesus explains what this means, or he, he gives us a sentence that explains what it means. 
who were in John 20. Let's go back to John 20. The first thing Jesus does, he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Ghost. What has he given them? He has just given them the keys to the kingdom. This is why he says at this point now, anybody whose sins you forgive or you remit, they are remitted unto them. I have given you a key that you can loose and it is loosed. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. I have given you a key that they can bind. Anything you bind, it is bound. Anything you loose, it is loosed. I have given you the key. And what is this key? The key is receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is the key to the kingdom. You possess the Holy Spirit. You possess the key that can unlock any door. And I will explain why this is. It, it, it just makes sense. It just makes logical, reasonable sense. Let me go on to look at a few other verses that show you why it makes sense. In Ephesians 4 and verse 20, we know this, this verse very well. Verse 30, Ephesians 4 and verse 30. It says, and grieve not. Not the Holy Spirit of God, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby or by which you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, the verse we read a little earlier on, it says that whatsoever is sealed with the king's seal, nobody can change it. Whatsoever is sealed with the king's seal, nobody can seal it. The seal that God places, places upon you is a key that guarantees you a place in the kingdom. But more than this, it, 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 it imparts to you the authority of the kingdom. It is the seal that sets you apart. But there's something more involved that I don't want to bypass. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, let me go back and look at the previous verse and, and, and make the point. Jesus says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And when, when a person receives the Holy Ghost, what does he receive? I asked a question, but I know all of you understand the question, and I know you, 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 you have the answer to the question. When you receive the Holy Spirit, we understand that the Holy Spirit is Christ himself. Everybody understands this. The Holy Spirit is Christ himself. The Bible may not say it. Yeah, the Bible does say it. Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, Now the Lord is that spirit. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's verse 17, I believe. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17. So when, when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, he was breathing his life upon his people. And in, in so so you know, last night when I was in this uh, study with the other group, I said, somebody asked a question, you know, you know, I, I was reading the verse where it says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 9 that um, the law is not made for a righteous person. And somebody asked a question, well, there's none righteous, no, not one. So, since we are not righteous, the law is made for us. And I, 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 I objected. I corrected the person. I said, My brother, I cannot agree with you. Because the scripture says, I have been made the righteousness of God in him. I can't, I can't claim to be unrighteous unless I deny Christ. In the same way, in the same way, when Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, I understand that. The authority that he gives to us is not my authority and it is not your authority. You don't have the power to bind heaven and you don't have the power to lose heaven or to, to lose things in heaven or bind things in heaven or to lose things on earth or to bind things on earth. You don't have that power and you don't have that authority. It is Jesus who has the keys of David. So what Jesus is saying is that I am going to come and I'm going to live inside of you. And when I take up my abode inside of you, you become an extension of me. This is the point. When Jesus says, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom. What is he giving to you? What he's actually giving to you is his own life, his own spirit. This is what is able to bind things on earth or loose things on earth, and the decision is ratified in heaven. Not because Brother David has any authority. Not because Sister Diane has any authority or our Brother Frederick. We have no authority in ourselves because, as I, as I said also in the meeting last night, take Christ from me and what am I? What am I if you take Christ from me? I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm, I'm back to square one to where I always was. I'm a person who has nothing and I, I, I am just as corrupt as anybody else. My only claim to something good is the presence of Christ living inside of me. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And therefore, whatever good appears in me is Christ living through me. So when Jesus says, I have the keys of the kingdom. He means Jesus does. He does not mean David does. But because Christ is living in David and David is allowing Christ to live, all the power and authority of Jesus Christ is to appear in my life and in the life of the church. So Jesus says, I will give you the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And what he means is, I will give you myself. That all the power that is given to me, all the authority that is given to me in heaven and in earth, it is yours. I just want us to understand that relationship properly. That none of us make the mistake because you know we humans have a, have a tendency that we, we 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 like to we like to take the glory to ourselves. We like to misunderstand and claim for ourselves what rightfully belongs to God. And so I, I want to be sure that we get the relationship right. I am not righteous. I am not good. I don't have any power. But I am connected to Jesus Christ who possesses all these things. What Jesus is saying is that what I'm looking for, my children, is somebody that I can display myself through. I'm looking for a vessel that I can shine through. Our place is to be that submissive vessel. Our place is not to be powerful or to be full of authority or to know our 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 abilities. That's not our place. The more we consider our nothingness, the more we become aware of our helplessness, the greater the potential for the glory to appear through us. Do we understand this? On our part, the key of the kingdom, the key to the kingdom is becoming completely aware of our nothingness on our part. Because this is the time when the Spirit of Christ can live through us. I mean, I'm saying, I'm suggesting to you that the key of the kingdom really is possessing the Holy Spirit, is possessing Christ. As far as I'm concerned, the key is possessing Christ. But on my part, my involvement is to make myself a submissive, available vessel. Because Jesus himself already possesses those keys. I don't need to create them. I don't need to create those keys or beg for those keys or seek for those keys. They are already mine if I mine if I have Christ. When he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, he was meaning, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And in giving you the Spirit, I'm giving you my own authority. David, may I have a question, please? Sure, Brother Wayne, go ahead. Is this the reason then why Peter could say to Anna and Sapphira, you have lied to the Holy Spirit, and for this reason he could say, um, somebody's going to pick up your body right now, and say the same thing to his wife, because he had the key that he could bind on earth or loose on earth. Is, is, and if you, is notice that what he said, if you notice what he said before he said that, he says, you have not lied unto men, but unto the Holy Spirit. So, so Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter and they lied to the church and they thought they were dealing with men. But Peter says, you, you are not dealing with men. You are dealing with the Holy Spirit because this is exactly the point that it is Christ living in you. So when the church has Christ living in us, when people deal with us, they are not dealing with David or Diane or Wayne 
or, or Abiyan, they are dealing with Jesus himself. That's the point. That's what it means to possess the keys of the kingdom. And this is why, I mean, poor Ananias and Sapphira, they moved among the brethren. They, they partook of the blessings, but they had no idea of the truth of what they were dealing with. They didn't, they, if they did, how could they have lied like this? How could they come before Peter and, and believe that in lying to Peter? They could get away with it. They were totally unaware. And, and the best I can say about this is that when the Spirit of God is manifested in the Church of God, people need to be careful of their behavior because. Because it is one thing to, to be defiant of God when, when the presence of God seems to be distant. But when you come into the presence of God and you show this kind of beer-faced defiance, Satan has every opportunity to take you over and God removes his protection. You identify yourself as not belonging to God. And in, in the presence of this power, our God is a com consuming fire. The presence that blesses one will destroy another. Now, I want to move on a little bit. Well, let me just read a couple of other verses to, to, to solidify this truth that we are talking about the Holy Spirit, which is Christ himself. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 22. We're familiar with Ephesians 4 and verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed to the day of redemption. But here are a couple of others that say the same thing. It says that God, now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath appointed us, hath anointed us, is God. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 21. Now verse 22. Who hath also sealed us. God has sealed us. His purpose for us is, is not changed. He has put a seal on us that nobody can change his purpose concerning us. And given the earnest or the down payment of the spirit in our hearts. This is a seal that God places on his people. He gives a spirit. When a denomination comes to you and say what we say. Like, like the pastor who disfellowshipped me. I, 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 I pitied this gentleman. He's dead now. But I mean, he said to me, you're on dangerous ground. I said, what do you mean, uh, Pastor? He said, when we, when we take your name out of the books, your name will be taken out of heaven. I looked at this man incredulously. I couldn't believe that a, a supposedly intelligent man could look at me and tell me such foolishness. I said to him, Pastor, you think you can take my name out of heaven? And he laughed. But from that moment, I lost my respect for him because I recognized he had no idea of the ways of God. I heard another, another minister who, who was... Uh, who was a conference representative. He was either the secretary of the conference or something, but I heard him preach at a church in St. Anne, and he says, when you become a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church, you're at the gate of heaven. And when you're at the gate, you're there. And um, this, this is the kind of, of, of nonsense that they, 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 they give to people. Now, can you look at a system like this and say what they bind on earth is bound in heaven? The great missing element is what we are looking at. It says God has, has given the down payment of the spirit in our hearts. This is the condition that entitles us to say I have the keys of heaven. No denomination set up by men, men who have been appointed by committees, men who have received their authority by going to a school and being ordained into a certain human position and they think that in this way they have obtained the authority to close heaven against men or to open heaven for people like the catholics believe that when they put a, a man to sit in a certain seat and the cardinals come together and they vote this man into position suddenly he becomes the voice of god on earth 
What a travesty, what an abuse of the word of God. But God cuts across all of this and he says, what is important? Receive the Holy Ghost, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the key to the kingdom. This is the key that gives you the authority that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Now I understand and I want to make this point that each individual Christian has this authority, but I don't want us to forget that also Jesus suggests that the church or when the believers gather together, there is greater power. I don't understand that fully. I, I tell you the truth. I don't understand why Sister Janet and I and Sister Nina and, and Sister Doreen, when we come together and we pray, it seems that there is a greater power than when I come alone. I don't understand it. But Jesus said it, and because he said it, I believe it. He says that where two or three of you are gathered together, and if two of you shall agree, it will be done of them, it will be done, done for them of my Father which is in heaven. I don't fully understand why, but I, I think it may have to do with the fact that when two or three come together, there is usually a greater degree of faith. I don't know, but maybe that is the reason. But I want to point that out and I want to make the point. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is I want to encourage us, brothers and sisters, to overcome something that has been one of my failings, one of my faults. One of my faults is that I'm a very individual person. I'm a very individualistic person. I, I always like to do things on my own. It has been a fault of mine. Even when I was in the secular world, they put a committee of us together to, to, to work on a project. And I got into a corner and I did something by myself. I used to drive people to frustration when they put me in groups because I just tend to be like that. But more and more, the Lord is showing me that when it comes to the business of the Lord and to the work of the Lord and to the church of God, God, Jesus gave himself for the church. If brother, if brother Frederick is strong and I am weak, the church is not strong. I can't build myself and leave the family behind. And if brother, brother Curtis is weak, we all are weak. So as we are building and seeking to move forward to the kingdom and, and, to, the, and, and to obtain the keys of the kingdom and move forward with Christ, we must, we must determine to help the weaker ones that we all might be strong. It is a church that Christ is coming for. Yes, each of us individually, but also he wants to see us as a united body. This is something that I'm not very strong on by nature. But I'm looking at the word of God and I'm seeing it. And because it is in the word of God, I know God can make me strong in this way. But I'm sharing it with all of us because I believe it is God's ideal. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How do they know you are my disciples? Because they see the love you have for each other. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Look here. You all don't have to tell me. I know that some of the most aggravating people are among the brethren. I know they have these ways that get on your nerves. They talk too much. They talk too long. They talk at the wrong time. They say the wrong things. They do things to offend. We have to see. And I, I do these things too. We have to see that these are the weak people among us. And we have to determine to help our brothers and sisters to rise above these things. Why? Because they're a part of the family and Jesus died for a church and, and 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 it is where we come together in this in this united way with the spirit of God in each one of us that we really experience the power of the kingdom 
All right, I'm going, it's going to get noisy because the rain just came down fairly hard and it's a zinc roof, so it's going to make a lot of noise. So if, if it gets to where you can't hear me so well, please let me know. All right. It's not falling really hard yet, but it looks like it's threatening to come. And that, that kind of leads me into the two, the two other important points I want to make. I saw Brother Morris put up a note earlier, earlier on that kind of ties into what I want to say. I believe that there are some, some conditions to being able to exercise this key of the kingdom. How many of us have the Holy Spirit? If you say, I don't know, I'm going to be a little bit disturbed. If you say, I don't know if I have the Spirit, I'm going to be a little bit disturbed. Because it means you don't know if you're a, if you're a Christian. You don't know if you're a Christian. And I'm not talking a Christian in the sense of somebody who, who holds to a theoretical, philosophical position. I mean a Christian in the sense that Christ is my life. I am in Christ. I have obtained Christ and he is in me. Everybody who, who can truly say, I am a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you have the key of the kingdom. And I'm hoping that's everybody in this room. But at the same time, I believe that there are a couple of other conditions that are hindering the exercise of this key. You put it in the door and you can't turn it because there are, are some conditions that are tied to possessing the key. It's not just having the key. You'll find that Jesus says something in one place and then he, he explains a little better in another place. And so I want to look at a couple of other places that I believe will add some, some more clarity to what we are looking at. Let me go, go back to this verse in um, Matthew chapter 16. I think this is what Brother Morris commented on. It's where Jesus says, I'm, I'm starting from verse 16, 15. Jesus says to the disciples, but whom say ye that I am? Who am I? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. God gave you this truth. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, you are a stone. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus starts a little sermon about building the church. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church upon this rock. And look at what he says now regarding this church. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus talks about giving the keys of the kingdom, he is referring to the church that is built upon the rock. And what is that rock? It is the rock that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Don't bypass this and don't, don't, don't play it. I think all of us have accepted this truth that Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. And that's the first principle of the kingdom. That's the first part of what it means to be a member of the church of the living God. You have accepted Jesus Christ as the son of God. This is the rock upon which the church is built. And all that is involved in, in Jesus being the son of God we have been exploring. We have been reaching for it. We have been finding it. So I would say, praise God, we have come to that first place. There are many Christians, many denominations who have not even reached this first level. They don't, they don't understand Jesus to be the Son of God. They use the terminology, but they don't believe it. They have not accepted it. You cannot be a part of the church of God if you have not accepted that Jesus is the Son of the living God. The second thing I want to emphasize, based on this, or it's the same thing, John 14, 
having recognized that Jesus is the Son of God, the first thing in exercising the keys of the kingdom is this. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name. Remember what I said earlier on. You have no authority. It is Jesus who has the authority. But we use his name, which means we're calling on his authority. And he says, when we do that, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you will ask anything in my name, I will do it. Which means that when we come to exercise this authority of the kingdom, when we come to turn this key, we must understand what it means to use the name of Jesus Christ. It means Jesus is working through us. Jesus is speaking through us. Jesus is doing through us, and we are doing nothing at all. It's this dependence on Christ. It's this, this understanding that Jesus is everything. That's the first point. That's the first point where I think maybe we need to, we need to have a, a little better understanding of what it means to come in the name of Jesus. And then the second thing, John 14, 16, John 14, 15, 21 and 23. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words. My father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now remember, remember what it is that gives us this authority. Jesus breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. That is the condition and that is the key. When the Holy Spirit abides in us, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. When the Holy Spirit abides in us, look at the condition. There is a condition for the Holy Spirit to abide with you. Because the Holy Spirit is Jesus and the Father. If a man love me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our home with him. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And that is the one that I will love and will manifest myself to him. So what I'm trying to say is that Receiving the Holy Spirit is first of all. But having received the Holy Spirit, we need to abide in that place. We need to abide in that place. How do we stay in that place where the Holy Spirit is living in us and manifesting himself through us, Christ in us? How do we maintain this place? This is the key. Well, let me not say this is the key. This is how to maintain the key. This is how to exercise the key. And Jesus says the, the, the way to do it is by keeping his commandments. And that's what I want us to focus on uh, uh, just at the end here, because we have always heard about keeping the commandments. And I think we have misunderstood or we have, we have, we have, we have had the wrong emphasis. Jesus makes it clear. John 13 and verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. This is what we commented on a, little, a little earlier on. In the way we love each other, in the way we serve each other, in the way we are united among ourselves, this is not only the evidence to the world that we are Christians, but it is also the key. It, 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 it is also the the, the, the hand that enables us to utilize the key of the kingdom. You can't exercise the key of the kingdom when you are disunited. You can't exercise the key of the kingdom when you don't love each other because Christ died for a church, not just for you. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking about something that I have a weakness in. I like to work alone. I'm not as, I'm not as, I'm not as much a community person as I believe God wants me to be. And what the Lord is saying is that a, an important element 
in exercising the key of the kingdom, the key that can open any door in God's kingdom. The key, the way to exercise this key, one, one important element is learning to love and to serve each other to the point where we have the unity among us that shows that we are truly the body of Christ. I know that the denominations are working for unity. They are working for the unity of the world. They have the ecumenical movement. They believe that when pastors come together and have a conference and they discuss theological issues, they are working towards unity. No, Paul says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. The unity of the spirit is the unity that is based on loving one another because Christ lives in each one of us. Not even because we have theological agreement. That may happen at some time, but theological agreement is not unity. There's one theological truth on which we have to unite. Yes, it is the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. We cannot compromise on the question of Jesus, who he is and what he means to us. That is the one salvational truth. That is salvational. We don't compromise on that, but otherwise, sometimes we disagree. But the basic element that binds God's people together in this bond that he's looking for is that element of love and unity. And another day I want to talk about what it means to demonstrate this love, what it means to show this love, what it means to live in this love, because the Bible is very strong on that as well. But this is what the Lord really highlights as, as a strong element in him being able to work among us. In Galatians 5 and verse 6, here's what it says. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. The engine that drives your faith is your love. The love of God in you drives your faith. I, I want to suggest something to you that is kind of a new thought to me, and it is this. If you don't have true love, you will not have true faith. How about that? If you don't have true love, you will not have true faith. So everybody is trying to exercise faith, and you're fasting and you're praying. I'm going to tell you, even if you understand the entire Bible and you, you see everything clearly, if you don't have love, your faith will not work. You will never have real faith because the thing is, true love is the element of God himself living and working in you. And this is what produces perfect faith. So you can't have faith unless you have, you can't have perfect faith unless you have perfect love. This is why Paul says, faith works by love. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, look at what it says. Same connection, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Receive ye the Holy Spirit, Christ in you. What happens from that? That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to understand, to comprehend with all the holy ones, with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height 